Hello everyone, my name is Michelle and I would like to welcome you to the History Live series at the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Our topic is coming home, African Americans returning from World War II. As you watch this program, you'll learn that in the face of racism and segregation, black men and women served in every branch of the armed services during World War II. And even after victory, black veterans continue the fight for freedom when they returned home. Today, we'll explore profiles in courage and artifacts that will reflect the economy, healthcare, education, housing, and political process for military veterans in the aftermath of World War II. Our living history interpreter, John McCaskill, will share how those engaged in the military made their service useful not only for the good of the country, but to benefit both their personal lives and their community. Throughout today's program, there'll be moments of reflection and I'll also pose questions to you all. You may share your responses in the chat and this program is recorded and will be made available on the museum's Ustream and YouTube channels. If you're watching this with others, feel free to have a discussion amongst yourselves. With that, I'll hand things over to John. September 1945, World War II came to an end. There were iconic visuals of people celebrating, ticker tape parades, and a sailor kissing a nurse in the middle of Times Square. Freedom and democracy had been preserved, and it would be a, the advent of a new day for everyone who made it possible. Or would it? The African-American experience of World War II veterans coming home was a much different experience. Since that first shot fired from Lexington Green, Massachusetts in 1775, blacks have defended this country. Now there was some pushback, there was some hesitancy. General George Washington, when he took over the Continental Army was very clear. He did not want the very old, he did not want the very young, and he did not want blacks. Now, the Second Amendment, in context of a well-regulated militia guarantees you the right to bear arms. But that did not necessarily mean black folk. As a matter of fact, there were ordinances on the books that forbade blacks from carrying weapons of any sort. Here's another issue. Defending the country and full citizenship go hand in hand. If an individual is willing to defend the country and if necessary, lay their life down for it, you cannot deny them full citizenship. Lord Dunmore of the British Army put out a declaration that essentially said, any man of color, whether free or enslaved, wants to defend the crown, he would definitely be granted his freedom. Well, that was problematic. Eventually, both sides wanted blacks to fight and defend. And many of them were even promised their freedom after the war. Now, wait a minute. If you're enslaved, what difference would it make to you who provided that freedom? Alexander Hamilton said that if you wanted to secure the fidelity of black folk, give them a musket and their freedom and they'll fight for you. After the war, General Marquis de Lafayette said that if he had known that this country was going to be a country of slaves, he never would have drawn his sword in defense of it. Now, blacks defended the country in the War of 1812 and in the Mexican-American War, but our next most cataclysmic war was the American Civil War. Now, we've always been taught that the Emancipation Proclamation freed individuals who were enslaved, when in fact it did not, nor had to po the power to free a single individual. If you were enslaved in the border states, and that was Maryland, Delaware, Missouri, Kentucky, and by 1863, West Virginia, you would still be enslaved. If you were enslaved anywhere where the Union was in control, certain parts of New Orleans, certain parts of Hampton Roads area, January 1st, you would still be enslaved. This document only affected individuals who were in states that were in rebellion to the Union. 
But there was one small clause in Mr. Lincoln's January 1st version of the Emancipation Proclamation that essentially said, any man of color who wants to fight for the Union Army or the Union Navy will be allowed to do so. What would have happened if those Confederate states had come back to the Union by 11.59 p.m. December 31st, 1862? They would have maintained their peculiar institution of slavery. But there was one small clause in Mr. Lincoln's January 1st version that essentially said this, any man of color who wants to fight for the Union Army or the Union Navy will be allowed to do so. Over 209,000 men of color, over 38,000 of them died in the process, said, you know what? We'll put our lives on the line for this unenforceable document. They joined the Army, they joined the Navy, and they were willing to defend this country when this country was not so willing to defend itself. Now, Mr. Frederick Douglass was very instrumental in recruiting troops for both the 54th and 55th Massachusetts. Amongst the first 23 individuals he recruited, two of them were his own sons, Lewis and Charles Douglass. Now, as a result of what blacks did in the American Civil War, they were finally authorized because remember prior to this it was illegal for them to fight but they were fighting out of the country's necessity but now they would fight and they would be authorized they originally put together about six different segregated units but after a few years they narrowed it down to four the 24th and 25th infantry regiments and the 9th and 10th cavalries now the latter two being what we know today as buffalo soldiers now, there was an optimism after the war, a new birth of freedom, if you will. But blacks were absolutely clear that if they were going to be successful, they had to be able to own property, have the right to vote, be able to educate themselves, and also to be able to negotiate their own work contract. So in the United States, we are fortunate to have and enjoy countless freedoms such as freedom of speech, freedom of religion, and freedom of the press that really make this country such a great place to live in. However, freedom in America has meant different things to different demographics at different times. So concepts like liberty, democracy, and freedom are nonlinear processes, often reflecting steps taken forward as well as steps taken backwards. Before John continues his journey through our exhibitions and looks at the courageous men and women that risk their lives to secure these various kinds of freedoms, I would like for you to reflect upon this question. What does freedom mean to you? the period following the Civil War, was a revolutionary political, social, and economic movement that reshaped the nation in profound and lasting ways. It exposed deep divisions and clashing visions among different groups of Americans about liberty, democracy, and freedom. It also compelled Americans to reckon with fundamental questions similar to the one that I had you answer earlier. Uh, in other words, what is the meaning of freedom and equality? What does it mean to be an American? who's entitled to the rights of citizenship. And then as John kind of alluded to earlier, if blacks were going to be successful and free, moving forward, they need to have access to an education, own their own property, have a right to vote or the political process, um, and have the ability to negotiate their own work. All these things are connected to prosperity. Of all the things freedom signified to newly freed people, the right to educate themselves and their children was the most prized. 
the right to read and to write denied to African Americans who were enslaved represented independence, opportunity, and the power to fully participate in the political, economic, and religious affairs of the community. During Reconstruction, access to education became a key measure of African American progress toward equal citizenship. As African Americans built lives as newly freed people, they sought to create independent spaces to provide refuge from white oppression. Freedom represented the opportunity to build vibrant communities through the creation of black institutions, including churches, schools, buildings, and associations. During Reconstruction, the Black church was a cornerstone for newly established African-American communities throughout the United States. For many, the church served not just as a place for worship, but also housed schools, social events, and political gatherings. Economic independence was also crucial to the newly freed. They knew that control of their own land and labor offered a solid foundation for self-sufficiency. Without that, they understood they remained under the power of white landowners who blocked them from attaining their goals. Consequently, thousands chose to move to new locations in hopes of finding better opportunities. Freedom offered African-Americans the opportunity to work for themselves. However, discriminatory laws passed by Southern state governments required newly freed people to sign labor contracts with white planters on unfair terms that were not much different from slavery. But starting in 1865, the Freedmen Bureau agents helped with contract negotiations and sometimes required planters to agree to more fair conditions and compensation. Still, there were a few bad apples, so there were some agents that sided with white employers and used their position to procure cheap labor for Southern plantations. Land is a form of wealth that can be passed down through the generations has provided financial independence, security, and opportunity to many African-American families and communities. Land of their own was a consistent aspiration of the newly freed. With land, they could grow crops to defend their families and sell for profit. Without land ownership, they had to work for or rent from landowners as agricultural workers or sharecroppers. Through the Freedmen Bureau, Newly freed people could buy or lease land confiscated by the U.S. government. In various parts of the South after the Civil War, newly freed people engaged in cooperative efforts to buy land and to establish independent communities. Economic cooperation enabled African Americans to acquire property and create businesses willing to serve their needs. They also banded together to defend their homes and farms from hostile white Southerners who targeted Black landowners. During Reconstruction, African Americans gained new civil and political rights, including the right to vote and hold elected office. However, these gains were short-lived. The Supreme Court issued narrow interpretations of the Reconstruction Amendments and invalidated the Civil Rights Act of 1875. Following readmission of the former Confederate States to the Union, the Compromise of 1877, and the removal of federal troops from the South, Southern states assumed home rule and reinstated anti-Black state governments. For example, in 1890, Mississippi had enacted a new constitution that coupled with other state legislations, limited African-Americans freedom, rights, and progress. It set the stage for segregation in Jim Crow. This will have a significant impact on the African-American servicemen and women. And John will continue our story from here. In 1915, two things happened. Number one was D.W. Griffith's Birth of a Nation and the resurgence of the Ku Klux Klan. Now, the Ku Klux Klan had first started just after the Civil War, pretty much went defunct, uh, but then it resurged again in 1915. But D.W. Griffith put out a movie that was strong in black stereotypes, and it depicted blacks in congressional halls, eating chicken, feet on the table with no shoes on, uh, but there's also images of a black person played by a white actor who was chasing a white woman around and because you know after all the only thing that the notion was that the only thing blacks uh, would do was go around raping women and so there's a scene where she jumps off the the cliff instead of being touched by that individual and at the end of the movie they actually uh, bring him to justice uh, and you know that justice could be an interesting type of thing. But he put that movie out 
But W.E.B. Du Bois, now this is 1915, W.E.B. Du Bois, Dr. Du Bois, encouraged when World War I rolled around that we would actually put our civil rights fight aside for the bigger issue, and that was to come together uh, soldier, shoulder to shoulder to defend the country. Let us, while the war lasts, forget our special grievances and close ranks shoulder to shoulder with our white fellow citizens fighting for democracy. We make no ordinary sacrifice, but we make it gladly and willingly. Of course, although blacks could fight, they had to fight on a segregated basis. There were two main infantry divisions during World War I, the 92nd Infantry Division and the 93rd. The 92nd fought under the American flag. The 93rd fought under the French flag. Now the 93rd fought valiantly and received awards after the war or during the war. And some of them received the Croix de Guerre, which is France's highest medal. The 92nd Division, which also engaged in fierce combat in Europe, did not fare as well. They did not get the same type of awards, even though they did put their bodies on the line. There would be a study based, or should I say, from the 92nd Infantry Division, and we'll get to that in just a minute. Now, there was racial unrest even at home. In 1917, the Camp Logan uh, mutiny took place. Um, a lot of the soldiers were being harassed and brutalized by the police, and many of them took up arms to do something about it. Uh, a lot of people, uh, well, people were shot, and in the final analysis, some of those black troops were executed. W.E.B. Du Bois would say after the war, he would talk about that the fight pretty much still continued and that we would still have to struggle even after coming home. I'm not quite sure what Mr. Du Bois, what Dr. Du Bois saw, whether or not he thought that people were all of a sudden going to be acceptance of blacks. He went on to say, we return, we return from fighting. We return fighting, make way for democracy. We saved it in France, and by the great Jehovah, we will save it in the United States of America, or know the reason why. As we set the stage to look at the challenges that lay ahead for World War I veterans, let's take a moment to listen to Dr. Kowalski Salter, the Executive Director for Museums at Cantonine Park First Division and Robert R. M. McCormick Museum and the curator for the museum's online exhibition, We Return Fighting, the African-American experience in World War I, as he explains the significance of a staged image that poetically speaks volumes. So we're here today to talk about uh, this incredible image, democracy versus mobocracy. And this is an image that we found in the development of this exhibition, uh, one of the many images that has not been published or seen anywhere else. And what it really is, it is actually a staged image. This is a young African-American man who went to fight to help the world safe for democracy because he and his brothers felt that they were gonna come home to democracy and citizenship and equality, but yet they came home actually to greater mob violence in the year of 1919. And so what you see in this poetic protest, as I call it, is you know he's a soldier in the civilian world now, but you see his uniform. And if you look closely, you see that he was a captain, you see his pistol, and you see other items of his uniform. But to me, I think the striking thing about this image is his facial expression. You can tell that he feels like he was betrayed going to fight to make the world safe for democracy, but then coming home and there was no democracy and equality waiting for him. World War I ended in November of 1918, but by the summer of 1919, racial tensions were once again at a head. We call it the Red Summer of 1919. 
over 25 U.S. cities, there were riots going on. And about 75 blacks were lynched. Some of them were veterans. Some of them were lynched in uniform. And why was it such a, a racial upheaval? Well, pretty much for the same reasons, over economics and housing. Thanks, John, for sharing some key insights into the summer of 1918. Before we segue to our discussion on double victory, let's take a quick break and listen to what our museum curator on American slavery, Mary Elliott, has to say about Black veterans who, while advocating for their civil rights and personal freedoms, were also stepping up to protect Black communities. And so here you have these men who go to war, World War I, and they return home and there's this idea of um, double the, the fight for um, freedom and democracy abroad and then having to fight for that at home. And so these men return and there's this period of, you know, they return to being lynched and the danger of just walking through the streets in their uniforms. And um, again, a racist and segregated United States. And so you see where there are race riots that occur throughout the nation. And these men who have fought um, abroad and come home, and again, that same military skill, they are present and ready to fight back. We often talk about People talk about victimization in African Americans being victims. But these men and women, <laughs> if I can say anything, we have to acknowledge there were some people who were like, you may try and kill me, but you're going to have to die trying. And so they use their skills to fight back. And they fight back in these communities where there are these so-called race riots taking place. I say so-called because when we think about, for example, the Tulsa race massacre, now people refer to this as the massacre, not the riot. Um, oftentimes you hear the word riot and it's almost like a reflection on the black people, black people were rioting. But in fact, these are incidents that occur oftentimes surrounding someone being accused of raping a young white woman. They take a man and, and they, they lynch them or they intend to lynch them. In the case of the Tulsa race massacre, a young man was in jail and the white citizens were prepared to pull him out of jail and um, ultimately lynch him. That was the understanding of the black community. And so they went to the, um, to the jailhouse to protect him. And so there's all of this that happens, but at the heart of this, you see these black men who are prepared to protect their communities and use that military skill. So they flip the script. You may come for me, you may try and lynch me, you may disrespect all that I did, all my service, all that I've done to protect this nation and lift up democracy, but I will be damned if you go and destroy my community. And so I, I really appreciate it because um, it shows the strength of the will of these men and women who were determined by any means necessary um, to be able to live free, equal, and with justice. In 1925, the Army put out a report on the use of Negro manpower during wartime. And the report essentially said that blacks were lazy, leaderless, shiftless, uh, non-patriotic, uh, didn't care about the country, were immoral, uh, inferior to whites in every way, and, you know, superstitious, afraid of dark, that type of stuff. Now, you can bring them into the military, but you just have to be careful what you have them doing. They can move a box from point A to point B, but don't expect them to do anything else. Now, this would be the lens that the Army would be looking through during World War II. The Selective Service Act of 1940 brought, or should I say, stated the conditions under which blacks would be brought into the military. Uh, and they would be brought in as soon as adequate provision for housing, sanitation services, hospitals, things of that nature, even where they ate. Uh, essentially what it was saying, although not in plain English, was segregation. By September or so of 1940, they were turning blacks away because they didn't have the adequate facilities for them. Mrs. Roosevelt continued to push to the president 
allowing blacks to participate in the war effort, that they needed to be trained in the military. A. Philip Randolph, who we know as one of the founders of the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom in, in 1963, was also planning a march too in 1941. And they were going to be planning a march to get blacks in industry as well as the military. And President Roosevelt was like, you don't have to protest for that, I can do that. And so President Roosevelt made provisions for that to happen and so they started to bring more blacks in. Medgar Evers joined the army right after he graduated high school. Medgar Evers was at Normandy. As a matter of fact, there were just under 2,000 African Americans at Normandy during D-Day in the initial waves. Another individual was Bill Simon of Washington, D.C. He was very instrumental in the school, uh, uh, school system in terms of uh, uh, the teachers union, but he arrived at Utah Beach at about 10 a.m. And there were a lot of individuals who participated in the Normandy invasion. And did I mention over one million blacks served in the U.S. military during World War II? They were fighting fascism overseas and racism at home. The Pittsburgh Courier called it the Double V Campaign. And as always, the media has a lot to do when it comes to social change. You would think that servicemen would have a sense of camaraderie of being on the same team. But many times it was difficult for black service members. Fifteen messmen who joined the Navy on the promise of learning a trade wrote the Pittsburgh Courier, quote, we sincerely hope to discourage any other colored boys who might have planned to join the Navy and make the same mistake we did. All they will become is seagoing bellhops, chambermaids, and dishwashers. We take it upon ourselves to write this letter regardless of any action the Navy authorities may take. We know it could not possibly surpass the mental cruelty inflicted upon us on this ship." Unquote. November 1942, while stationed at Camp Polk, Louisiana, Private Merle Monroe wrote a letter to the Pittsburgh Courier describing the black soldier's struggle to maintain a sense of patriotic pride in the face of lynching. He wrote, morale to the Negro, as with every human being, is like yeast to bread. Morale puffs us up with love and pride for our country. It puffs us up with the will to fight, to resist any change by force to our way of life. Morale, in a broad sense, is knowledge and understanding of, and faith in the high principles our country must represent, the right to live our lives unhampered by strings of prejudice, the right to earn bread, a place in the sun for us and our posterity. And with these necessary stimulants, we Negro soldiers will resist with every inch of our stature, any threat to our country's laws, laws that must protect our rights during periods of tranquility. Thanks again, John, for providing insights regarding the sentiments of African-American soldiers during World War II. As the Pittsburgh Courier, as well as other Black newspapers reported at the time, soldiers were keenly aware of the hypocrisy of fighting a war that was theoretically about democracy, while at the same time having a racially segregated military. During the war years, the segregation practice of civilian life spilled over into the military. I'd like for you to take a moment to consider this question. How were opportunities and obstacles intertwined for African-Americans serving in the military during World War II? We are soldiers in the army. We have to fight although we have to cry. We have to hold up the bloodstained banner. We've got Oh, we are so.
African Americans served in numerous units during World War II. They served in the Montford Point Marines, who were African Americans who were a part of the Marine Corps. They also served in the 92nd and 93rd Infantry Divisions, which were the descendants of those who fought in World War I. The 92nd was in Italy, the 93rd was in the Pacific. The Triple Nickel, so the 555th Parachute Infantry Regiment, which was a part of the 82nd Airborne. The 761st Tank Battalion, there were other tank battalions that served in Europe as well. The 333rd Field Artillery, and of course, the 6888 Central Postal Directory Battalion, led by the highest ranking African American in Europe during the, world, the war, Major Charity Adams. As John noted, African Americans served in several military units during World War II. For example, 800 women of the 6888 Central Postal Directory Battalion arrived in England in February 1945. Their commander was Major Charity Adams, shown here in this photo. And she's inspecting the Women's Auxiliary Corps, or WACs. In fact, more than 6,500 African-American women served in the military during World War II. WAC served at installations with large numbers of African-American soldiers, and the 6888 served in Europe. Uh, there were also Black nurses that served throughout the specifics and in Europe, and women served alongside other units as well in the Coast Guard and other areas. Fighting a dual battle against sexism and racism, they epitomized the World War II women's motto free a man to fight. This video that I'm about to show you shows the activities of the African-American Women's Auxiliary Corps. You'll note that the activities include training, recruitment, clerical work, and even recreations, such as the Army's nurses playing cards and knitting, and a whack band in a parade. A new job for these colored women of the Women's Army Corps, speeding the recovery of fighting men just back from over there. At Halloran General Hospital, Staten Island, New York, the post office staff is now made up of Negro wax. In the wards, they work as assistants. Straighten out that kink in your back. The hydrotherapy room. Here, leg and arm whirlpools for scientific water cure. They're making bird praise for a job well done to these women of the wax. Normally, blacks in the Navy were stewards, so they're washing dishes and maybe their battle station would be passing gunpowder. But the USS Mason was the only all black crew and for the exception of the officers, every sailor on that ship was African American. Now I've made mention that just under 2000 African Americans were in the beginning waves of D-Day, but I did not mention the 320th Barrage Balloon Battalion. Their job was to go on the, on the beaches, raise hot air balloons to keep enemy fighters from strafing the troops on the beaches, and they had to do that in the first waves. There are a lot of casualties in the first wave. The Red Ball Express is important because those guys were driving supplies up to the front line. I met an individual by the name of Nathaniel Johnson. I met him during the 70th anniversary of D-Day. I asked him at one point at the World War II Memorial, what did you do in the war, sir? And he sort of ashamedly said, oh, I was a truck driver. Let me tell you, I lit up. I was like, wait a minute, you part of the Red Ball Express? Red Ball Express? I was, I was stopping people who I didn't know, said, hey, this guy was part of the Red Ball Express. We celebrated him tremendously the entire time he was there. And of course, when the Battle of the Bulge started in December of 1944, once again, out of necessity, they started bringing black troops in to fight side by side with white troops. The only stipulation was you would have to give up your rank because they did not want black officers or higher NCOs giving orders to white troops. But one of the most recognized units for African Americans during World War II was the Tuskegee Airmen, which comprised of the 332nd Fighter Group and the 477th bombardment group. African Americans saw World War II as a chance to finally end a separate but equal nation. They fought for the right to fight and to claim an equal place in a democratic society. 
Benjamin O. Davis Sr., commander of the Tuskegee Airmen, overcame discrimination. He helped pave the way for others. After more than 42 years of military service, he was promoted to Brigadier General in 1940. Tuskegee Airman Alexander Jefferson discusses what it was like working with Davis in this next clip. Going out with the parachute on your back and standing at the door was Benjamin Oliver Davis Jr. Tall, ramrod, quote, gentlemen, stay with the bombers. Now, when a full bird colonel tells you to keep your behind in formation, you're in formation and somebody hollers, bogey's at nine o'clock. And you look out at nine o'clock, about 15 or 20 miles away, all these little black specks, German fighters. Normally, you say, tally ho, let's go get them. Uh -uh, no, 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 no. B.O. Davis said, keep your so-and-so in formation. I stayed with the bombers. I never got a chance to shoot at a German fighter. They why never. Did, why did he tell you that? Ah. Oh, we found out later. At the time, we were young and full of tea and vinegar. We didn't, stupid enough, we didn't know. B.O. Davis knew that if we had left the bombers to shoot down German fighters and the Germans came in from the other side, if they had shot down one B-17 and it got back to the Armed Services Committee, at that time chaired by Strom Thurmond, the whole group would have been pulled back and we would be flying escort up and down Florida. We didn't realize this. But you see, B.O. Davis came out of West Point in 1936. And for six years, he had been an ROTC instructor fighting the system. He realized the significance of it all. And so consequently, he knew that we had to stay in formation. As you surmise from our discussion thus far, African-American service men and women faced many challenges during the war. And while there were many obstacles to overcome and barriers to break, there are also many stories of valor, honor, and bravery. The spirit of Tuskegee shown here has been on display in the museum since we opened our doors on the National Mall in 2015. The plane is one of only a few aircraft with direct ties to the Tuskegee Airmen. We'll pause for a moment and take a closer look at the object on view. Smithsonian Secretary Lonnie Bunch, who's also the founding director of the Naus Museum of African American History and Culture, explains why this object is so important to our nation's history. Not many people know the history of the Tuskegee Airmen, but we're about to change that. Throughout all of American history, one of the most important stories of heroism is the story of the Tuskegee Airmen. They trained for war in a system designed for their failure, at a program set up to show that they weren't on par with white pilots. Instead, they proved over and over in the skies above Europe that not only were they the equal of anyone who had ever flown, they had a message for their country and even the world, that through their perseverance, sacrifice, and excellence, they could reshape history. Their success paved the way for the integration of the U.S. military, the federal government, and the nation as a whole. When our museum opens its doors on the National Mall in 2015, we'll be proud to showcase the spirit of Tuskegee, one of only a few remaining aircraft with direct ties to the Tuskegee Airmen. What makes this plane so exciting isn't only its remarkable past, it's the way it brings people together to learn the individual stories of some of America's most important citizens. The system said we were ignorant and childlike, incompetent, and we were not able to fly a piece of high-class machinery. And of course, we proved them wrong. Tuskegee, Alabama is where the flying school was. It was the worst place in the country for Negroes. That's where we're called in. We were not only learning to fly, 
We were out to prove a point. That look, we as a race of people can do anything you can do, only do it better. The 332nd Fighter Group earned the name for themselves of being the people who would escort those bombers to the target, stay with them, protect them, and get them back home. Valor is strength of mind or spirit that enables a person to encounter danger with firmness. Honor is striving to always do right in your dealings with others, regardless if they do right by you. I think if you combine these traits, you have the making of a very heroic person or a person who is great for accomplishing brave acts and has very fine qualities. Tell me, what brave acts do you think the Tuskegee Airmen face on and off the battlefield? A buzzer took a monkey for a ride in the air. The monkey thought that everything was on the square. The buzzer tried to throw the monkey off his back, but the monkey grabbed his neck and said, Now listen, Jack, straighten up and fly right. Straighten up and fly right. Straighten up and fly right. Cool down, Papa, don't you blow your top. Ain't no use in diving. What's the use of jiving? And even though American service personnel were fighting and dying together, racism was still rampant. In 1943, Henry Jones of the 349th Aviation Squadron wrote Mrs. Roosevelt and said that Jim Crowism was being practiced on base facilities, particularly restaurants and recreational facilities. August 1944, an owner of a small restaurant down in Shreveport, Louisiana, shot four black service personnel who he said were trying to take over his establishment. So although we were fighting overseas, there was still a lot of pushback domestically. During the war, oftentimes black service personnel would have to sit behind German and Italian POWs to be served or have to go around to the back to be served. And they'd have to sit behind them during USO show tours. Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Stewart, who is a Tuskegee Airman in, who lives in Michigan, uh, told me that when he was going down for flight training, he left from Corona, New York. He and his friends, and he grew up with uh, uh, friends of, of all backgrounds, they all rode the train together from Corona to Washington, D.C. But after they got to D.C., the conductor says, oh, you're going to have to move to a different part of the car. All of them were moving together. He says, oh, no, not you guys, him, referring to Colonel Stewart. And here's what he did. He told Colonel Stewart he'd have to go to the segregated part of the car. Now, we're still in the same car, but the rear of the car was designated as the Jim Crow car, at least in this instance. Sometimes it would be an entire car and the facilities would not necessarily be the same. Now, Colonel Stewart told me, he said that when he saw that Jim Crow car, he said the bathroom was so terrible, he couldn't use it and he held, uh, he held himself for about 24 hours. But that was his experience going down and many times that would be the case. Once you cross the Mason-Dixon line, you would be subjected to a different type of service and many black folk did that. Tuskegee Airman Alexander Jefferson talks about that when he came back to the United States, he saw the Statue of Liberty in the distance. But when he came down the gangplank, he saw a white corporal with a sign that said whites to one side, uh, Negroes uh, to the other side, and Negroes was not the word that he used. Uh, blacks faced mistreatment, violence, and lynching when they came home. Many of them were pushing for the right to vote. Twelve individuals were lynched in 1945 alone. June 1947, Joe Nathan Roberts, uh, who was attending Temple University, had come home to visit his parents down in Sardis, Georgia. A group of white men got upset because he did not address them as sir. They kidnapped him from his parents' house later that evening, and he was shot and killed. September 9th, 1948, 28-year-old Isaiah Nixon was shot outside of his house 
in front of his wife and six children. This was just hours after he had exercised his right to vote. After World War II, many veterans came home to the GI Bill, which was actually a product of veterans who came home from World War I and didn't have jobs or things to come back home to. But the GI Bill would make sure that that would not happen to World War II veterans. And they had quite a few points. The GI Bill gave World War II veterans many options and benefits. Those who wished to continue their education in college or vocation school could do so tuition free up to $500 while also receiving a cost of living stipend. As a result, almost 49% of college admissions in 1947 were veterans. The GI Bill opened the door of higher education to the working class in a way never before done. The bill provided a $20 weekly unemployment benefit for up to one year for veterans looking for work. Job counseling was also available. The government guaranteed loans for veterans who borrowed money to purchase a home, to start a business, or to purchase a farm. These loans enable hordes of people to abandon city life and move to mass produced cookie cutter homes in suburbia. This exodus from major cities would help shape America's socio, economic, and political landscape for years to come. Medical care for veterans was also provided in the GI Bill. Additional hospitals were established for veterans and the Veterans Administration took over all veteran related concerns. By 1956, almost 10 million veterans had received GI benefits. In some southern states, they were steered to menial jobs instead of college. Even if an African-American received tuition money, their choices were slim since many colleges were segregated, especially in the southern states. African-American veterans in the north fared somewhat better, but still did not receive a higher education in numbers anywhere near their white peers. College choices for women were also slim since men almost always received enrollment preference. The discrimination did not end with education. Local banks in the South often refused to lend money to African Americans to buy a home. Even with the government backing the loan and many of America's new suburban neighborhoods prohibited African Americans from moving in. As a result, Many African Americans remained in the cities as whites flocked to the South. Although the GI Bill extended benefits to all veterans, regardless of gender or race, it was easier for some people to collect than others. In many cases, benefits were administered by an all white veteran administration at the state or local level. African Americans and women struggled to receive higher education loans. Roscoe Brown, Tuskegee Airman, who is credited with shooting down an ME-262, and of course, if he was here, he would say he was the first to do it, said that after the war, he applied to fly for the airlines. He submitted an application and presented it to a secretary. He left out of the office and then realized he had left his newspaper. When he went back in to get his newspaper, he saw her putting his application into the trash can. Well. He caught her in the process and she ashamedly said, you're black, they're not going to hire you here. Reverend Dr. Walter Fontroy, who was on Dr. King's DC staff once said, and this is where I got it from, I call it the Fontroy Five. He says that every American citizen should have access to or the opportunity for education, economics, housing, health care and the political process, which includes both judicial and political. Any one of those will affect the other four and any two will affect each other differently. That is why those five things are so important to an American citizen. And these veterans were fighting to obtain them. Since the American Civil War, at least 60 African Americans have received the Medal of Honor but none of them received it during or shortly after World War II. Those who did receive it, received it years later. And when it was awarded to them, six of them were awarded posthumously. The only person who was there alive at the time was World War II veteran Vernon Baker.
The Congressional Gold Medal is the highest civilian award presented by the US Congress. It is awarded to an individual or group for an outstanding deed or act of service to the security, prosperity, and national interests of the United States. The medal shown here was presented to the Tuskegee Airmen, African-American pilots flying for the US Army Air Forces during World War II. Awarded on March 29, 2007, the medal recognized their unique military record that inspired revolutionary reform to the armed forces. Let's pause for a moment and listen to Tuskegee Airman Herbert Carter's discuss his greatest challenge. And having gone through life up to this 92 years, uh, quite often the question is raised, how did you overcome some of the difficulties and handicaps that you must have experienced as a young man growing up here in the South land, growing up in America. And I look at it as one of the greatest challenges ever made upon me as a human being was to be able to see the good in the American people in spite of their imperfections and to have hope that I can change some of those perceptions if I apply myself in a sense of excellence and in a sense of, well, damn, he can fly, he can, he's a pilot. The America that I am a citizen of says that I am free, I am open and available to achieve whatever opportunities there are for me. And it's my responsibility to be able to take advantage of every opportunity to demonstrate that I do have those qualities. It makes no difference what the pigmentation of my skin is or what my background might be. African Americans proved once and for all after World War II that not only would they fight, but if necessary, die for the nation. Over one million individuals, African Americans, served in World War II, and many others who were on the home front fought for the right to work in the defense industry. As a result of all of this, President Harry S. Truman signed Executive Order 9980, which uh, pledged better uh, or equal practices in government establishes, establishment in 9981 was the beginning of the desegregation process of the United States military. So why is all of this important? Listen, if you want a team to be great, it means one thing, you've got to find great players. And it means that we have to train up this next generation of leaders to have character, to be competent in what they choose to do, and to have a camaraderie where they want to inspire others to be great. Dr. Carter G. Woodson, the founder of what we know as African American History Month, said that if you don't see yourself in history, you will be relegated to a place of negligibility and you will be on the verge of extinction. Oh, this next generation has got to see themselves in history and not just a picture of being enslaved. We are particularly grateful to all of our veterans, particularly our African American veterans who fought fascism overseas and racism at home. We stand on their shoulders and we acknowledge all of them. And so this ends our program for the day. I'd like to once again, thank John for doing another fantastic job. I hope that through today's discussion, you were better able to see how African-Americans engaged in the military were able to make their service useful, not only for the good of their country, 
but to benefit both their personal lives and their communities. As we conclude, I'd like to leave you with one more look at the spirit of the Tuskegee. I look forward to seeing you at our next History Alive program. Have a good day. Well, our first air show was the Reno Air Races in 2008, and we had signature cards that we um, had with four Tuskegee Airmen on, and we were having the guys sign those signature cards and hand them out to the public. And I thought, you know, what could I have these guys sign? Something that would be really special that we could hang on to and take with us when we go to air shows. And I thought, hey, what better than the aircraft itself? So uh, Tina and I got together and talked about it. We thought, well, you know, if we have them sign the outside of the airplane, eventually it's going to have too much of the elements and it'll get ruined. So we chose the inside of the baggage compartment. And the very first Tuskegee Airman to sign the airplane was Lieutenant Colonel Harvey, right here. And under his name, it says he's the first Top Gun in 1949. And uh, the Air Force had their first Top Gun competition at uh, what is now uh, Nellis Air Force Base in Nevada. And the Tuskegee Airmen took first place in that competition. So really fun to have him sign the airplane. Alexander Jefferson, who we did quite a few air shows with, he was a POW for nine months in Germany. Uh, Bill Holloman, who we worked with probably more than anybody, uh, he passed away a year ago in June. And uh, he flew in World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. And he's the first black helicopter pilot also in the Vietnam War. And then uh, James Warren, who uh, also was a navigator bombardier in World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. And notably, he flew the Hanoi taxi uh, to pick up the POWs in North Vietnam at the end of the Vietnam War. So another one that's really uh, I like a lot is Claude Platt. He was an instructor at Tuskegee for the entire war. And um, so, you know, anyone that flew at Tuskegee in late 44 or 45 would have probably flown this airplane, but we know he probably flew it many, many times. Let's see, how about, uh, how about right there? It's a lot of fun having, having those guys sign the airplane. We're running out of real estate there on the baggage door, so uh, when we get out to the convention this week, we're probably going to have to open up a few more hatches to have them start signing, but really excited to have that, and I think it's fun for them to sign it also because, number one, they know that their signature is going to be going into the Smithsonian and preserved forever, um, and it's also neat because um, when they look at the door, a lot of times they'll start pointing out names that they recognize, and then that stirs further conversation about the people that we've had out with us. And it's been very memorable and a lot of fun for everybody.